because this is kind of like our grades um, and my department chair and so on will look at this kind of stuff. Uh, so please do fill out uh, these evaluations. Um, we will, like, I also appreciate feedback um, and we'll also have, like, talk a little bit more about feedback and how we can make this class better informally next time. Okay, are we ready? Great. So today we'll be doing two things, so actually three things. We'll first talk about text visualization in a slightly abbreviated fashion since we don't have a ton of time. Then I want to do a design exercise for set visualization, and then I'll talk about set visualization. Um, I can tell you right now that we won't be covering everything that I have prepared, so there will be some stuff in set visualization that we won't be talking about. So we did this um, design critique last time, uh, but now I just want to like jump right into text and language. So, um, like, what are the features of text? Um, like, in the apps, like, what, what, like, language can be very abstract, it's very general, um, it's extremely um, expressive, um, so we basically can communicate anything that we want in language, right? This is much more than we can just do with numbers. Um, it's different across population groups, countries, accents, uh, religions, but even like more than language, there's a lot of semantic knowledge that we have, like how you order a subway is something that like, you learn, right? But this is also a piece of language. Um, we have like text is something that we linearly perceive if you read it, so we don't really get a lot of um, information if you just look at the page. Um, this is in dif this is very different from um, like the other data, like from data visualization. Um, and text is semi-structured, so there's structures like grammar and words and sentences and paragraphs, but this isn't really easy to formalize. Um, and then we have things like appearance, typography, calligraphy, and so on. And all of those play also a role in how we perceive information from text. And like, why do we visualize text? Like, why couldn't you just read it? Well, of course, um, sometimes you kind of want some higher level analysis of text. You want to like maybe pick what to read. You want to understand the sentiment of a document. Maybe help you choose what to read, um, and so on. And like. The usual argument is, um, like in any kind of data uh, subject as well, there's so much data nowadays, and this is just a graph showing that there is so much data nowadays. Um, typography is really like about the appearance of text. So things like typefence, uh, typefaces, also like how they're styled, like serif, sans serif, bold, italic, uh, the size of the font, line spacing, uh, spacing between groups of letters, spacing between pairs of letters, the kerning, Combination of letters of, of glyphs is ligatures. So I don't know where, you, like, if you've ever noticed this kind of stuff here, so that, that you can um, do these ligatures here, like FL, and like make this into uh, a combined one-letter word. Um, and so creating a font is more an art, and there isn't really any evidence that one font is more legible um, and leads to more like better uh, comprehension and so on. So people. Really, like there was theories that serif fonts are better, like lead to better understanding than sans serif fonts, but there is really no evidence right now for that. So, like this is a little bit of a pseudoscience if people tell you about that. What does matter though is like other choices that you make about uh, fonts. So you might have heard about the like problem at the Oscars a couple of years ago when they announced the wrong movie for best picture. So the best picture that year was Moonlight, uh, Moonlight, um, and the word really. Um, and Faye Dunaway announced La La Land as the best picture. Um, and this was like a complicated uh, thing that went wrong here. Like in most, like in most failure cases or most catastrophes, there's multiple things that went wrong. But one of the things that went wrong is also typography, right? So uh, Warren Beatty was handed the wrong envelope to announce uh, the winner of best picture. Um, and uh, so he was handed the uh, envelope for best actress instead of best picture. Um, and he was standing on the stage there, and like unsure and reading it and seeing like this was the card that he got. He saw Emma Stone and he was unsure. And then Faye Dunaway kind of like uh, simply said, oh, it's La La Land. Because she found La La Land is here. This is what she was looking for. She parsed that um, and set that up. And then like a whole problem ensued. And of course, what went wrong here is like, first, she should never have gotten the wrong envelope, right? But I'm not going to talk about this. But clearly also typography was wrong, right? So. Like, why does Oscars need to be the biggest word on here? Uh, why is, um, like, in the best actress case, why is the movie exactly as prominent as the actor, right? So all of this isn't really, uh, and why is best actress, like, such a small side note down, uh, down here? So in, like, the 
speed of that situation when you're on stage and unsure, like um, Warren Beatty simply didn't um, identify all of those um, aspects. But if you like had designed the card like this, it's very likely that he would have like recognized that he actually had was handed the wrong card and might have been able to correct this before he said that. Um, this is of course like a larger failure in a complicated system. Um, and there's like a nice podcast, um, like 99% um, Invisible, um, about like what actually went wrong here and like larger lessons to learn from this. Um, so I definitely recommend that podcast. But just so, just to say that typography matters, um, it's also part of the visualization design. You can kind of apply many of the principles that we learn about in class, like show what is important the most prominently, uh, also with typography. So um, when we talk about visualization, there's like a spectrum, like as we have when we talk about tablet visualization, and how much computational support do we need? And like um, text visualization or text analysis is really like a very analytical process, right? So there's a lot of like the field of NLP is huge. There's like many many algorithms we have like in a uh, very good class about NLP that some of you might be taking. Um, so like I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I can also do some things uh, on raw text. Um, basically, text and some user interactions or some kind of like um, semantic information. So here, like of course, we have we use kind of like visualizations or advanced typography um, in like in our daily lives. We have links that are highlighted. We have pictures. We have boldface and so on. Um, you have like overview and detail. So if you were to look at like uh, a PDF, you you get usually something like. Um, you have your main page here, and then you have like a, a preview of different pages that allow you to quickly skim, are there any figures on that page that I might be interested in, this is the beginning of a new chapter, and so on. And then, of course, if you program, you're using text visualization because um, your IDE will very likely have syntax highlighting and kind of like understand a little bit more about the text that you're creating um, and gives you like highlights for different elements in the programming language. There are also some more esoteric text visualizations that use raw text. We've seen the perspective lens here. This is like essentially um, a similar idea to the, uh, the thumbnails that we saw in a, in a preview for PDFs, but here just like using 3D perspective. This is historically interesting. Very frequently, I have a hard time finding it, right? It's like, it's, it's like the highlight isn't quite effective enough. And that's the problem with this particular project here, Tacos. They like actually, like if you search for something, um, they would like really make it very salient. So that's another idea um, of doing that. Um, this is a project that we did a while ago. Um, like usually when we read something on a screen, uh, we have only a small window into like what we like text is very long, right? We have like many pages. Uh, we could have multiple windows. And so if you search for a term, um, it like most of the instances of that term might be hidden, might be in different windows, and so on. And so here we build a system. That like links to like you, in this case you search for like uh, France in like an article about the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, um, and you can see that there is a lot of different windows open, um, and some of the content is just not visible, right? And so it links between all of these different instances, and it even points to like okay, there's more stuff if you scroll down, and then here's a preview of all of the occurrences similar to what you saw with the thumbnails in the preview. So that's just one idea, again, like using more or less raw text without anything smarter here. But if we want to kind of like do something smarter, we have to kind of extract something out of the text. So we talked about this unstructured versus structured data, and NLP is really about extracting structure from the unstructured data source text. And so here, if we take this term or this, this phrase, unstructured text, we can analyze it. For example, say there's four times uh, T, three times U, two times R, two times E, and so on. So this would be one way of extracting structure. Might not be the most useful way in many contexts, but uh, for like depending on the question you have, it might be. Um, another way to extract text features are simple counts, like bag of words approaches. And this is often used for similarity measures. So for example, if I have um, a text, a document here, document one, that is about princesses and dragons and castles, uh, and then I can kind of like measure the similarity to other documents whether they share the same term. And this is like a very common uh, approach to measure similarity of documents. There's many, many other steps that you typically do when you want to derive these kinds of features, like cleaning text using, for example, regular expressions, sentence, split, sentence splitting, changing everything to lowercase, Stop word removal, things like that, A. 
um, and some stemming so that you have only the relevant uh, part of the, um, the board, uh, part of speech tagging, uh, noun chunking, name entity recognition, uh, deep parsing, meaning trying to really understand the text and sound. But I'm not going to go into any of those, but just to highlight and something, if you're taking an NLP class, you're very aware of this. Um, text is tricky, complicated. You very often need a lot of contextual knowledge to understand what's going on. Like, toilet out of, out of order, please use floor below. Could be interpreted in two different ways, and hopefully everybody gets what really is meant. Um, or these two other examples here. Um, did you ever hear the story about the blind carpenter who picked up his hammer and hammer and saw? So like, ambiguity is very common in text, and that's something that's really hard um, to, to really like properly parse out. So like, if we think about text as a hierarchy, we have like different levels, and visualization can be visualizations can be designed for all of those different levels. We would have things like letters, words, word groups, sentences, paragraphs. And that's kind of like part of linguistic visualization. Then we have sections, chapters, and documents. That would be a document visualization piece. And then document cluster, corpora, uh, corpus, or a corpus of corpora. Uh, so like that essentially are, are document collections. So for example, in intelligence analysis, very frequently you work with text corpora, right? You want to find some kind of like, whatever, you have tons of emails. For example, the Enron data set is a lot of e emails uh, where you can kind of like identify common threads, uh, common threads, common uh, like subjects, and so on uh, with text visualization or text analytics. And so we have kind of like these four types of text visualization. And I'm going to talk about those two here predominantly, but I'll give you some kind of hints at what you can do at this space. So like visualizing individual documents, visualizing corpora, uh, visualization for NLP, that's kind of like a new area. Like how can you actually support um, NLP algorithms um, and with visualization, or like basically do some kind of like um, analyzing algorithms, debugging algorithms, and so on. There's a lot of work recently um, with the whole deep learning boom in that space. And then creativity support. Like, can a visualization make you a better writer or a poet? Um, this kind of questions. So let's start off with document visualization. So like the thing that you probably have seen is the word list. The word list, like based on a paper about many eyes from Fernanda Villegas and Martin Wattenberg in 2009. Um, that's a very simple approach. You simply take, um, um, you, you count the words in a document or in the in a, in a text that you provide to this algorithm, um, and then you scale it by frequency, and then you nest it. And so why do you think is, like, why is it nested like this? Safe space. Safe space is one argument. Yeah, so you kind of like emphasize you know, the most frequent word is somewhere around the center, but it's also like about like appearance novelty, right? So like you could just do a list of words uh, and scale them accordingly, and it might look pretty boring. You can also vary font type, size, color. And so on. Unfortunately, the original tools um, are now like they were written in Java and Java applets, and that doesn't really work anymore. But here is a, like an academic tool um, where you can actually create a word. Paste some text here. That I can use to demo this. So this is the uh, poem, The Cat in the Hat. Um, and like I've created a world by this. And you can see cat, fish, hat, house um, are like prominent features of the cat in the hat. Um, this particular implementation, you uh, also have this force embedding. So you can kind of rearrange it manually. And it will like, um, re like it will basically can find you your word like this. Um, you can like, click read layout. You can change colors and so on. So, this is how you can like create a word. Um, so if you compare this to just like a traditional tag cloud, tag clouds have been around much longer. I think most people would agree that the left one here is much more engaging uh, than the right one. The right one seems pretty boring. Uh, and of course, you can like embed this into various shapes, like your classical wordles. Or you can like give it some constraints in the boundary. You can do this kind of stuff with a force-based uh, embedding. Um, another idea is a word tree. Again, 
fairly simple, and this is mostly useful for text that has some kind of like repetitive structure, like make poems or for songs very frequently. So, like if we have a uh, text like this, if love be rough with you, and so on, if love be blind, if love be blind, it kind of like ta takes the the structure, like the shared structure between sentences, and then scales it by the number of instances here, and then you see if love be um, is larger, and then you branch off into rough or blind, and you see that blind is a little bit larger, so it occurs more frequently than rough and so on. Um, this is again like from the same group, uh, Wartenberg and Vegas, around the same time as Wordles. Here's like an implementation. Um, this is like a visualization of blowing in the wind uh, by Bob Dylan. Um, so you, you basically see that like each of these phrases or each of the um, sent or the sent well, paragraphs essentially starts with how many, and then you have most frequently times, and then second most frequently years, and then you can zoom in here and so on. So you get the idea. And I did show this before. This is like basically extracting simple structure from text uh, by a simple rule. In this case, uh, the beget um, like. Abraham, you get Isaac, you get Jack, Jacob, and then you get like can extract the family structure out of this. Um, so um, this is how this works, like or worked. This is also unfortunately offline nowadays, um, but but essentially you simply um, put in your rule here, um, and then it would create this phrase metaphor. Another visualization that you might have seen if you just look at XKCD is storytelling, right? And so this here is um, storylines um, that shows you kind of like the Lord of the Rings character and where they co-occurred. Um, so like the, the location that they, um, like when they were in the same place, they are adjacent to each other. So you see up here like the fellowship uh, uh, taking off and then like all of these different developments here. Uh, and XKCD did this, of course, like manually and humorously. Like, there's the 12th Angry Man. Uh, has anybody, anybody seen this movie? This is like 12 people stay in the same room during the whole movie. Uh, so simple to create. Uh, and um, sometimes, like XKCD has actually led like various this researchers to actually implement this algorithmically. And so there's now multiple papers that. Um, implement these kind of story evolutions um, uh, algorithmically so that they can automatically create those. Um, and yeah, so there's you know, various implementations. You can use them for different things. Um, so that I think this is kind of a neat idea. Okay, I want to move on to visualizing text corpora. Um, and so the challenge for like for text corpora, you have a couple of different goals potentially. Like first, you often want to discover some interesting documents. You want to like summarize documents so that you can quickly understand the, the corpus. You want to classify documents in is it an email, is it a like a, a memo, or is it some kind of like other like texts or tweets or anything like that. You want to in extract facts, which is kind of very common in intelligence uh, in, uh, analysis. And so, in contrast to um, just pure document visualization, you also often have contextual information for these corpora. So, for example, if you have an email data set, you have like uh, things like uh, sender and recipient. Uh, you have the timestamp. You have things like the mail client, um, the date, and so on. Um, and of course, you have like lower level structures like paragraphs and figures. You might have revisions or annotations or comments or anything like that. And so, you have a little bit more metadata um, than you have in just like a single document. And so. There are projects here that are like that, that do things like visualize um, a library catalog, the Bohemian Bookshelf here. This is a uh, project by the Hendricks and Sheila Carpendale. Um, I'll just show the video briefly. The Bohemian Bookshelf allows developing through book collections to support selling their discoveries. It consists of five interlinked visualizations that each provide a unique overview of the data set from different perspectives. The cover color circles shows an overview of the collection based on the book's cover colors. Moving across the visualization reveals previews of the covers. When a book is selected, books that have a similar cover color appear. They can be selected as well. 
Keyword chain socialization shows relations between books based on keywords. From the selected book in the center, keyword chains branch out like tentacles. To facilitate reading, the keyword chains can be stretched out. Each keyword forms a connection to another book panel that shares this keyword with the book in the center. Selecting a book moves it to the center and new keyword chains form around it. The author style organizes books in alphabetical order by author. So what you can see here, so is, this isn't meant to be like a super analytical approach, right? This is meant to be like, I'm in a library, I'm there for pleasure, and I might want to just explore the collection. So this is made with like, uh, in, like I need to extract facts from this corpus uh, in mind, but really as like something that you can engage with and play with. Um, the typical approach to like analyze similarity between documents in a corpus are multi-dimensional scaling approaches. You use like a bag of words to project uh, documents with respect to the text similarity into um, a landscape. So this is like the classical approach that ideally you will find that uh, documents that have similar content will cluster next to each other, um, and then you will be able to, for example, like select some kind of subset, uh, as you see here, and then get a little bit of an like preview of what are the keywords in these documents. So here you have graph drawing on the left, and then here you have user interface on the right, a collection of these kinds of documents. Uh, and so this is more meant for towards like classification and kind of like um, looking at like what are similarities and kind of uh, identifying these types of documents. And so there's many, many approaches that, uh, or many, many visualization techniques that use this basic approach of projecting similar documents into space. Um, one other idea of visualizing a collection is, is this, this tool document cards. Um, here, this is for scientific papers. Um, they extract important terms and also figures and then represent each document as a little thumbnail that has things like the titles and keywords and key figures. And so um, this is like what this looks like. Here you have on the right, um, well, this is like, a, I have a, like, yeah, here are some examples. So these are meant, like, these are all of these are different papers. You have like the title at the top, you have some figures, and then you have like a little word cloud embedded, but you can also jump through the pages if you want to get a preview of those pages. And this way, you can kind of quickly grasp the content of multiple papers. Of course, if you want to read them in depth, you would go to this material. Um, another thing, like another approach that is kind of like uses this, this basic MDS uh, idea is to uh, compare, like here, an example, a study for designing, for comparing text corpora of three different uh, visualization subconferences, like Infamous Cybis and Siggraph, but this was kind of created um, automatically. And so you see which topics belongs to what each of these conferences. So you see, like, um, Siggraph is, you have things like deformation, simulation, force, energy, reconstruction, camera, video. Um, whereas in uh, Infobis, you have topics such as uh, bundle, network, node, graph, edge, legend, projection, wordle, document. And so on, and that, but we also have some kind of topics that are at the intersection here, like algorithm, methods, uh, computer approach, number, problem, point, result, and so on. So some of these words are kind of artifacts of our academic writing, like method, right? Uh, but some uh, kind of like hint at some shared topics between um, between those subjects, and they have like a pretty intricate. Um, visualiz visual encoding for like which of these topics belongs to which um, area the most, and so on. Um, the kind of like classical visualization for intelligence analysis is jigsaw. This is really meant for like, hey, I have this corpora of emails and I want to like find any potentially suspicious information in there. Uh, and so I'll play this video for a brief introduction. This scenario presents an exploration of the 9-11 report using the Jigsaw Visual Analytics system. Here, we treat each page of the report as a separate document in a collection. Entity identification first determines the people, places, and organizations mentioned throughout the collection. An analyst can explore lists of these entities by type. 
Sorting each entity list by frequency shows the most common entities of each type. <coughs> Selecting an entity, such as Osama bin Laden, highlights in orange all entities co-occurring with him on some page. Darker orange indicates a stronger connection. Further sorting of a list by this connection strength brings the strongest connections to the top. Note the strong connections to different organizations, people, and locations. An alternate view of the collection represents each document as a small rectangle and clusters the documents by theme. Three keywords help communicate the topic of each cluster. Selecting an entity such as Bin Laden in one view highlights all documents it occurs in within the other views. Bin Laden is frequently mentioned in the clusters Interview 2004 FDNY and Attacks Operators Taliban. A graph view of the collection depicts entities as small colored circles and documents as white rectangles, all connected through network edges. Here we load and expand the Donald Rumsfeld entity. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is like a common approach right, to identify common threads, um, and this was one of the first papers that did that. Um, we did a project where we like um, this was more about synthesizing intelligence or information that you extracted while analyzing um, um, uh, like a text corpus. So here, like the the, the interesting thing about this is that. Uh, the, the interface that you see here in the background is kind of like let you create a mind map of like here is one uh, entity or one thing that I found and then here are the different connections and what was interesting about the system was that it sourced everything to the original document so um, you would have for example if you have like extracted Hank Floss as chief operating officer from this particular document you would actually like if you clicked on this it will pull up the, the source document and highlight the specific instance of that um, in like even across uh, different application windows um, and so on. Um, and then there's of course a lot of um, corpus analysis of social media content. So here is like a simple example of uh, um, for Twitter data. This is called like a visual back channel for large scale events. So how the system works is you put in some hashtag and it will retrieve all of the tweets related to the hashtag and then show you like what are the themes in those tweets um, and who are the participants, what are the photos that were, uh, were posted, how did those themes evolve over time, and then of course also give you the actual data here. So I'm going to skip over this. Um, and now like I just want to like wrap up text visualization with a couple of pointers here. This is this visualization for NLP stuff. So there is um, like three papers that I just wanted to point you at. Um, I'll show the first one a little bit because it's kind of like a super cool idea. This is um, statistical detection and visualization of generated text. And so you probably have heard of that um, algorithms like deep learning um, uh, GANs can now actually create text that looks reasonably uh, like legible, almost if it, as if a human had written it. So here is a text that was uh, generated. Uh, by a neural network. The following is a transcript from the Guardian's interview with the British, British ambassador to the UN, John Bray. Um, Bray said, this is, or Bray, the situation in Syria is very dire. We have a number of reports of chemical weapons being used in the country. So if you read those two first sentences here, it's kind of hard to tell that this is algorithmically generated, right? So this is kind of like a pretty good fake. Of course, if you read the whole document, it might not make sense, it might not align with the rest of what you've been thinking about, but what they're doing here is they color code based on how likely would a generative network um, pick the next word, given what already was written here. Um, and so they have like this color code for every single word, and you see that all of these words are very likely to have been picked uh, by an algorithm. Um, and so if we compare this to a human written article, um, here is an article from the New York Times, and you can see that there are like many more surprises in there, that like the, uh, that the words that actually appear in the text were like not within the top hundred of most likely words that an algorithm would pick, right? 
And so just by looking at the signature of these texts, you now can kind of discover this text is like quite likely not um, computer generated. And so there are a couple of different examples on here. Here is like another machine uh, generated text. So this is a little bit essentially uh, looks a little bit less obvious, but still you have mostly like you have exclusively top hundred words in here. Um, and then here is one that is a little bit um, well something that we would easily identify as either satirical or false, like in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns uh, living in a remote, previously unexplored valley. Um, but uh, like for human text, we can see like this is fairly like reliable to detect. And I kind of like the, the, the basic idea. It's a very simple visualization, right? Actually trivial, and the contribution here is really mostly about um, like coming up with this idea, um, not so much about the visual encoding. Uh, but I find it fairly effective. Um, this is another tool here, LSTMVIS, for long short term memory uh, networks that you basically can analyze like where your neural network goes, goes wrong. And then here's another paper um, that's uh, a Utah paper um, visual exploration of semantic relation relationships in word embeddings. Um, so just like Google that title if, you, if you're interested in that. And then for creativity support, I just wanted to point to one paper here that's from our group. Um, so this was like a study that they did with poets. So they wanted to essentially um, like work with poets to help them read poems, or not, not help them read, but kind of like understand what's going on in a poem. And so they were looking at rhymes and what are the kind of phonetic patterns um, in the poem? What are the kinds of structures? Are there any hidden rhymes that are only accessible um, after like a close or second reading and so on. And so they did like a detailed definition of what are all the different kinds of rhymes and then they built this interactive system. But that wasn't really meant to like formally like analyze a poem, but essentially just to give people new ideas of how to read a poem. And so this is kind of like the space of creativity support. Um, I want to close the whole thing about text visualization by pointing you to another collection of, of related work. Um, so here you have an overview of 440 text visualization techniques. Um, if you're interested in that, like there's like this is a very good collection of all text visualization papers. Um, like you can see, there's these. Um, like, you can get a preview, you get a classification, uh, like, we've, like if we've seen systems like this before, you can filter and so on. So like if you want to learn more about text visualization, this is the resource to go to. Okay. So now moving on to sets. Um, and I want to start off set visualization with this design workshop today. Um, and so let's suppose you have like um, a list of items that have membership in certain sets, like item 1 in A, item 2 in A, item 3 in A and B, um, and so on. How would you visualize this? Cardinality is less than 3, so, or 3 or less, so you can use a Venn diagram. Exactly. So a Venn diagram is like the obvious solution for this. Um, so we would create something like this, and then we can easily show that. And so it turns out that um, Venn diagrams are super popular. This is a paper from like a Nature paper that published the like, first sequencing of the banana genome, um, and they did use this particular figure here. And I showed this to you at the very beginning of class, right? This is a six-set Venn diagram. It's supposed to show the genetic overlap um, of these six different plant species. And so clearly, this isn't an ideal solution because six-set Venn diagrams are really hard to parse, and we don't have like the the data is proportional to the visual encoding. Um, and so on. Um, and so um, I kind of like skip over this, um, but I kind of want to like this is not an isolated incident. We've seen many of those figures, and now I want you to think a little bit about how could you design an alternative to this. So here is like a simple data set. We have uh, Simpsons characters: Lisa, Bart, Homer, Mr. Burns. Um, then some characteristics that we'll treat as sets. Uh, are they in school? Are they female? Are they in school? Are they male? Power plant worker, male. Are they evil? Power plant or male? And then we have some attributes about them, like their age. Um, and so, uh, first I want to ask, 
what are the kinds of things that you might like learn want to learn from this? Um, and um, in this uh, workshop, like um, I would like you to work in groups, like spend five minutes getting to know the data and like, trying to understand like what are the kinds of things that you would want to ask of it. Then uh, create two rapid prototypes. Uh, you take about five minutes for each, and then write up um, these. Well, this was originally for uh, three, but uh, just write up your two uh, solutions, um, and then you can upload this to this new bonus category on Dropbox. Um, you have until the end of day today. Uh, we'll take about 25 minutes for this exercise. If you don't wrap up here, you can of course just wrap up after class. Um, I just wanted to like ask, give you a couple of hints on, on questions that you might might want to ask. Like, what is the biggest intersection? Which set sets make up an intersection? How big is an intersection? Does it work for more than four sets? Does attribute values correlate with intersections? Is one question you could ask. And then one other like final recommendation. Um, don't always try to show every single element, right? Like if I gave you um, a data set with all Simpsons characters ever published, think about would your visualization technique scale to that as well? Um, maybe you want to do something um, more abstract than that. So here are the paper instructions, and um, I'm first happy to answer any questions. Yeah. 
Without the without necessarily having four data out of there. Just because I don't know. <laughs> But if you just have that problem, you can do that problem. Sure, we got it. 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 We Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Assignment is the whole thing, and Dropbox is just where you upload things. 
I don't know. Like, I actually don't like the words. <laughs> because it's just like, I thought it was like, they, they did something more like, like, well, like, drop box. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, no. 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 Yeah, I think the how this one is a but yeah, you could do some of the same um, Yeah, I think this works. Um, I guess the challenge would be what happens if you have um, 500 characters for any of those things. So then in that case, the thing on the lines have a little bit of transparency and a little bit of efficacy. Uh, well, but then you like for for which one? For, yeah, well, in both cases, like what you do for both of those here is that you show every single character, right? um, and sometimes you just want to understand like what's the relationship. Are the people that are in school all the ones so, like, like the here? Obviously, uh, and that's a different question. Uh, I think your your solutions are both good if you really want to look at the details of each record. Um, but if you just want to understand like the pattern between evil and power plant for a large set of data, then they would work it. Yeah, you and you probably don't. You're probably not able to show the individual items. So if we're doing that version, that diagram, for example, wouldn't, wouldn't show you uh, the people, right? It would just show how many people are in each intersection. So in terms of our condition, we just make something about the biggest set or the biggest intersection? Uh, yeah. Only two by two, only two. Sure, you can do that. Um, but then, like, that's a uh, very query based approach, right? So it has a problem. Because the number of uh, intersections is wrong. Yeah, two power men. But uh, the thing is that. In practice, you're limited by the number of records, right? You have all empty intersections. Most people don't care about those. Well, most, most intersections don't care about those. You're sort of searching this exponential yeah. growing yeah. space. Yeah. Well, I think that basically it, it is an expansion of growing space, but um, in practice, most of the intersections are empty, right? And so you don't actually need to show them. That's what a Venn diagram shows every single intersection. Um, but in the you are always like, at, at worst, you have as many intersections as you have elements in your system. So, if, like, if you have like ten sets, you have two to uh, three power of, eight, of ten uh, possible intersections, but only if your future thousand high elements that can only be at most about so it's kind of like a more reasonable approach than that. So say you don't need a two bubble intersection. Yeah, that's a or just get all the possible intersections and then sort it on the bar chart. Yeah. And then that would just be uh how far so we should have just Yeah, exactly. There's just some approaches that are common. So it hasn't itself is already happy. No, I don't know. So, like Excel, if you if you start like whatever, um, you can do a lot of data transformations, but like you can, I guess you could, yeah, like you can create Excel. I don't know what it's doing, but it, you can program it, right? So you can do a lot of stuff in, in, in Excel. Sure, a pivot table is nothing else than a compact. Of course, that's like something if you ever, whenever you want to aggregate, um, it's kind of a key operation. <laughs> I like that. I like that.
So in this case, so we're only going to say class rate, Okay, so um, if you're not done yet, just like wrap it up up fast. Um, I would just wanted to talk a little bit uh, about some of the possibilities to visualize these uh, sets and their intersections. I'll give you a bit of an overview and also show some of the designs that like, people in previous iterations of this exercise have, have created. So, um, <laughs> the obvious what, what you do when you have sets and what you think about when you have sets are, of course, Venn and Euler diagrams. Um, what is the difference between a Venn and a Euler diagram? A Venn diagram shows all the possible logical relations between sets, even if empty, uh, and the Euler diagram only shows the uh, the non-empty intersection. So here is like a, like a surprisingly complicated uh, Euler diagram of the relationship between different geographic entities uh, on the British Isles, Isles, like the British Isles, the British Islands, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Scotland, England, Wales, and so on. They're all like in a complicated relationship, but there are empty sets here that are not shown. Uh, whereas, uh, I can read that. Well, animals, four-legged, and minerals doesn't have an intersection. Right? Um, so, when like Venn diagrams, why are Venn diagrams good? Well, Venn diagrams are good because they're super intuitive. Right? You learn in elementary school what what sets are. Maybe like I'm not in elementary school, but you learn in school what sets are. And if when when you're first taught what sets are, it's illustrated with with a Venn diagram. Um, and um, so in that sense, they're super intuitive, but of course, Venn diagrams are hard for many sets. Uh, and the number of intersections in a Venn diagram is 2 to the power of n. So clearly, this isn't going to work for anything larger than, uh, let's say, 7 or 8. So here are some kind of like possible Venn diagrams for 4, 5, 6, uh, and 7 sets. And um, I think 6, six is the most. But this is like. Yes, it is a Venn diagram, and yes, it it does work, but this isn't a useful uh, visualization. Right? This is just like a mathematical existence proof that you can create something like that, but not necessarily uh, a useful visualization. Um, the thing is that if you want to use a Venn diagram or a Euler diagram to communicate the magnitude of a set, then you should really try to make the area proportional. Um, that's kind of like um, that, that makes the, the chart readable independent of its labels, right? Um, but um, Venn diagrams actually don't allow that because you need to show some empty intersections. So the essential area proportional have to be Euler diagrams. Um, and it turns out that creating area proportional Euler diagrams is hard for especially anything uh, larger than three. So there are approximation algorithms that are still fairly slow. Um, but you also have this, like as usual, when we talk about some kind of layout, we have can op and we can formulate these op uh, optimization criteria. Uh, like obviously, area proportional is is necessary. You do want simple curves because otherwise you get into these weird shapes where you can't really perceive the area, um, and then it also makes it easier to identify uh, which sets are participating uh, in an intersection. You want good continuation um, and so on. Um, and so there are approaches to do this, I think, for up to four sets. Um, but and, like these are usually not perfect. Um, so like which of those two here do you think is a better Venn diagram? Oh. Right, yeah. Because it's very obvious, right? Just by like the, I, I can like easily identify the segment here in the middle. What are the sets that participate in it? So you really want these 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 sh shape, the simple shapes. Um, the complex shapes here take a lot more uh, mental effort to parse. Um, 
So this is here is an area proportional uh, Venn diagram. You can actually create something with a Euler ape like this. Uh, but of course, the problem is that even in an error proportional Venn diagram, it can be hard to judge which of these two segments here is larger. So who thinks the left one is larger? Raise your hands. Who thinks the right one is larger? OK, it looks like most of you got it right. The left one is larger here. Uh, but it's tricky to do, right? So reflecting pros and cons. Uh, pros, Venn diagrams or Euler diagrams are super familiar. They're intuitive. They work well for two to four sets. Um, so basically, my recommendation would be if you have two of to four sets, then just use a Venn or Euler diagram um, to visualize this. But it doesn't work more for um, for more than four sets. And error proportionality is hard to do. Um, they are also like you can't really show attributes for the segment. So you would have to use like a multiple view approach with a table where you have the intersection or something like that. Um, you can also um, show the relationship for specific items. This is um, like from a, a paper that's called Untangling Euler Diagrams by Natalie Rich. Um, and so there's two different designs here. Like you know, in this one case, like the, think about these are people that know each other. They are connected in like one set. Um, and so Abigail, Addison, and Andrew know each other, but they also know Sophia, and they also know Anthony, right? Um, and so um, you get these kind of like nested levels here. Um, and that kind of tends to get complicated, but it's possible. Um, and here is an alternative. Um, so here they have these simple shapes, but they duplicate the nodes. So for example, Chloe is now in, in, in the blue like circle of friendship, but also in the green one, but also in the, in the violet one, and so on. They show this duplication of nodes uh, with these arcs between them. And so when I asked people previously to um, like do this exercise, of course I saw like a fair number of, of Venn diagrams. So here are like some uh, some examples. Some people did like rectangular Venn diagrams, um, and and some also tried to do that and combine it in this case here with like a positional encoding of age. Um, if you want to show something like this. Um, uh, on top of a fixed layout, there's a couple of approaches, and those are actually quite interesting. So here is like a map of, of New York City. Uh, I think one uh, set here is restaurants, the other one is hotels, um, and so you can see like where those are. Uh, this is again like a force directed approach for these halls. Um, and, and here on the right, you see like a, a, a data set about countries, um, and you see the continents are um, highlighted with. Um, this bubble set texture on top of it. So the green one that you see very salient here is Sub-Saharan Africa. And people have developed various um, spins of this basic idea. Um, so here, like this is a simpler, uh, a simpler approach that you simply draw a line through all of the participating elements. Um, and this one here is, is um, a kind of a riff on this. It, uh, in, in contrast, like this is one continuous line here. And this one simply also includes branches, so the overall um, length of the line is a little bit, um, like there's less extra uh, lines in here. Um, a completely different way of, uh, of showing these uh, relationships are node link techniques. You can treat each set as a node um, and connect to elements that are in that set. Um, so here, for example, here's a core, um, like authors on the top. Um, then papers, you could think of these papers as the sets. Um, and then keywords for those. And you can connect each author to the paper, um, and then each paper to the keyword. So you can kind of like reframe the set visualization problem um, as, a, as a note or as a graph problem. And of course, um, here are some examples of how uh, students have done this. And so like we see these kinds of, um, like here, a hierarchical approach, and then here more like a traditional node link approach. Um, one thing that you can do if you have a lot of data um, is like not actually show intersections, but only show co-occurrence in sets. Um, so this, this this kind of like is the most scalable um, a solution. So here, um, like this doesn't show us anything higher order, but it shows us like co-occurrence. Um, and you can't really show attributes with this, but here's an example of genes that are co-mutated, like in, um, in the in the genome of like. Um, a couple of hundred of samples, and so you see that like the list of genes, they are ordered by how many uh, elements are in this co-occurrence, and you see 
Titan, P10, EGFR, TP53, and so on um, in this matrix. And if you have like um, a co-mutation between those different genes, it basically like is uh, increases the the um, uh, it makes it darker um, proportional to the elements in the co-occurrence. So like if you don't care, like I from this chart I can't read whether EGFR commutates with TP53 and also always with Titan, for example. This is not, like, I can't read that from that chart, but of course, this is a very scalable approach. Um, like, a completely different approach is these, um, these set matrices. This is like a technique that's called onsets. So um, these here, every cell is a set, uh, and you have very few items. Um, so these are actually whale sharks in the um, Atlanta Aquarium. Um, and whether they have, they found some chemical compounds in their blood, and so they have like these 40 different compounds in here. Um, and, and so like we have very few items, but a lot of sets. Um, and so they simply have this, this grid, and each set is always at the same position. And so then you can compare which chemical compounds are in each of these whale sharks. And then they have some kind of like fancy operations where you can do logical ends or logical ors by simply moving those cards on top of each other to see what are the co-occurrences, what, uh, what are the unique uh, items, uh, the unique sets, uh, and so on. So this is kind of like, uh, like a good solution if you have a lot of sets but very few items. Um, another way um, of visualizing um, sets would be these linear diagrams. And so here, um, if you uh, basically what you showed here is um, like each set um, is uh, like like basically you're showing all of the possible core occurrences. If you can draw like a line down here, that means like there's people that speak Italian, Hungarian, and French, um, but there is no people that speak Italian. Um, um, so sorry. Now this is just like what are the possibilities? So this would be the corresponding uh, Venn diagram for that. Um, those, of course, as you can imagine, um, get pretty cluttered and are fairly hard to read, and they tend to get very fragmented. Um, so, like, they, yeah, like their solution, but not necessarily like much better than uh, alternative solutions. And yeah, like people have done uh, these kinds of things. Um, you can also think of these uh, like, uh, and, and an ex more explicit matrix um, as like the equivalent to the line diagram. I think like the, the matrix actually is a better solution here because you have actual labels um, on top of that here. Um, another idea is like basically using arcs. Um, so here we have um, this is called the technique radial sets, and the fundamental idea is that the sets are segments on a circle, and the relationships between the sets are encoded as ribbons. Um, and as you can imagine, this works best for like pairwise intersections, but doesn't work all that well for higher order intersections. They have some like methods to do that, but it looks fairly uh, tricky. Um, and in this particular method, they also show the histogram of like how many um, how many uh, like um, co -occur like co occurrences are um, in uh, at degree one, at degree two, at degree three with uh, different elements. Um, and yeah, people have um, tried to like, do this, uh, and it does work. Um, and it's um, fairly scalable, um, but it's not quite as um, scalable as other approaches. And I kind of want to close by talking a little bit about this one. This is a technique that we built. Um, and that's a fairly simple idea, but, but turns out to be kind of powerful. So like, if we recap, we want to do some efficient visual encoding uh, with set visualization. So we want, instead of using this abstract shape, we want to use something that is perceptually efficient, like bar charts. Um, but which we could also ask, like, hey, how about, can we create complex slices of data sets? Can we kind of combine something like this with a query system? And how can we visualize attributes about any of those other sections? Um, and so this is kind of the tool that we built. Um, this is a data set of movie genres. Um, and I think I showed this before, but like not from a set perspective. Um, so we have the visualization of intersections. Then we show properties about those intersections. Then properties of the individual elements and some uh, query information and then some details about the attributes. But like, what's the, what's the idea here? So 
like you have, we represent each of these <coughs> sets here as a column in a matrix, right? So we have columns A, B, C corresponding to the sets A, B, and C. And then we introduce a row for every single possible intersection. So here first we have the universal set that is not in any of the elements uh, or the, the empty set uh, in the first row. Then in the second row we have the just A elements, so what corresponds to the blue segment in this Venn diagram. Then we have the just B elements and the just C elements. Um, and then we keep com continuing with the pairwise of the section. So A and B, um, then um, B and C, and our A and C, and B and C. And then finally, the uh, intersection of all possible sets. And so now, like we have a way of identifying each of these intersections in this matrix. We use these filled in circles to, to indicate that if they participate, and we use these like um, handles connecting them to show that you should really read this row wise, and that the uh, like the row is what is what we care about. That the columns, like you shouldn't like just because two rows are neighbors, that doesn't, isn't particularly meaningful. Um, and now we can plot the cardinality or the size of each of these intersection with a simple bar chart. And so this is just like a different representation. You can plot the same data here um, and see, like here you can very quickly spot like. This here is our largest um, uh, intersection. What's nice about this layout is that I also can plot attributes on top of it. Um, and so, for example, I could like add, I could calculate the metric, how surprising is the size of an intersection, or I could ask something like, what's the distribution of an attribute in an intersection, and I could, could, could plot some distribution plots like box plots here. So, like I just want to like give like. Before I wrap up, show this one example of what, like, how you could like do an anal analysis with this. So what I'm looking here are uh, at the movie genres. I've, I've collected all adventure movies here and all documentary movies here. Um, and what you quickly see here is that documentaries are not typically multi-genre genre. It's not a genre that pairs much with other genres. So we have like one instance here of a comedy document, or four instances of a comedy documentary, but most documentaries are just their own thing. Whereas adventure movies kind of like pair up a lot. And so you see the individual documentaries here on the right, um, and you see that documentaries, like we plot here, released there versus rating, we see that documentaries are fairly recent, but they are also fairly highly rated. Um, if you look at adventure movies, in contrast, we see that they mix a lot, right? There's many different combinations. It's actually like uh, action adventure is more common than just adventure. Um, and so you see like uh, many, many different combinations. So they tend to be multi-genre. Genre, this is a genre that mixes frequently. Um, and you can see that we have a lot more spread in rating, right? So adventure movies are less highly rated on average than documentaries. Um, and so this is like how you would do an analysis with this. And we actually also built like an R version of this so you can kind of integrate this easily um, if you like work in R um, or you can use our JavaScript version. Okay, that's it. Um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, and then I'll see you guys on Tuesday for best project presentations and wrap up on Thursday for the exam.